If you look around, you might have noticed that nature loves variety. Everything alive is a variation of its kindred, and there is not one living organism that in its existence stands alone without any variance or kindred. Most often than not, each variation of any certain type of living organism is fully functional to its own type and kind and without possessing any defect. Look at how many beautiful varieties of each kind of life share our world with us. From the birds to the air, to the fish in the sea, plant life, jungle life, wildlife. Not to forget the microscopic forms of life. Too many people get all tangled up in angry debates and allow the beauty and splendor of life to pass them by. So much valuable time gets wasted on silly debates about creation or evolution. So much energy gets focused on winning silly arguments. The issue is that we are here and we need to make the best of our lives and put all of the fighting and debating away. Whether it was created or evolved isn't the issue. As for human beings, the same laws apply. A normal childbirth would be described once the mother goes into labor spontaneously. This usually happens close to the due date between weeks 37 and 42 of pregnancy. The baby is born head first, but may include intervention by a healthcare professional to support or help the birth. The most conventional medical examination of a newborn baby will include an elaborate examination of the infant's head, chest, heart, abdomen, femoral pulses, genitalia, hips, feet, nervous system, and spine. This routine physical examination takes only a few minutes and is typically carried out for all infants at the earliest possible moment after birth, and again, just before discharge from the maternity hospital. Hopefully, an infant passes all of the aforementioned examinations and gets a passing APGAR score. A score of 7, 8, or 9 is normal and is a sign that the newborn is in good health. A score of 10 is very unusual since almost all newborns lose one point for blue hands and feet. Virginia Apgar invented the Apgar score in 1952 as a simple method to quickly assess the health of newborn children immediately after birth. Currently, there is no examination given at birth to observe chromosomes or the anterior hypothalamus, both of which medical scientists have linked to the intersex and transgender variety of human beings. An infant can be born with sexual anatomy, reproductive organs, and or chromosome patterns that do not fit the typical cultural definition of male or female. The label used for this is called intersex. 
This is a variation of how one out of every 100 infants in the world is born. This may be apparent at birth or become so later in life. So, folks, it's very clear that we're born with our genitalia. We don't learn them and we don't choose them. But what about sexual behavior? Do we learn our sexual identity? Do we choose our sexual orientation? I'm going to give you four lines of evidence that show that the organization activation mechanism works in the brain the same way it does in the genitalia in people like it does in all other animals. And these four lines of evidence are the animal work, the David Reimer story, sexuality of intersex people, and human brain work where we're comparing trans and gay brains to the brains of Adams and Eves. The animal work. In 1959, the first paper showing the biological origins of, of uh, sexual behavior where they described uh, treating female guinea pigs with testosterone during the later stage of pregnancy. This is after the genitalia have formed. And upon puberty activation, these guinea pigs, uh, although they were female, uh, had sexual behavior that was very male-like. So this showed that the testosterone was organizing the brain and the behavior was affected later in life. And many, many, many mammals have been looked at over the years since then, and all of the evidence points to a determining influence of prenatal hormones uh, when it comes to sexual behavior, without exception. And something else we know from the animal work is this part of the brain here, called the hypothalamus, that's hooked up to the pituitary, which it controls, and it's also hooked up to the ancient emotional mammal brain, the limbic system. We know the hypothalamus is the place for instinctive drives and behaviors. When you're hungry, when you're thirsty, when you're sleepy, that's your hypothalamus talking to you. It's in charge of you. You are not in charge of it. And it's also in charge of sexual function. It's important to know that this limbic system, one component of which is the amygdala, the source of all your emotions and emotional expression, and this hypothalamus that are hooked up to each other, these are ancient places in the brain, similar in all mammals. We also know from the animal work that it's this front part of the hypothalamus in blue. This is a rat and that's a you. It doesn't matter because it's always the anterior hypothalamus that controls sexual behavior. We can show this. If we lesion this area, we destroy the sexual behavior in both sexes. If we stimulate it with hormone implants, we get that sexual behavior. If we look at this part of the brain under the microscope, we see sexually dimorphic nuclei. That is, different sized nuclei between males and females suggesting this area of the brain has something to do with sexuality. In order to tell you about David Reimer and the intersex people, I have to introduce these two adversaries, John Money and Milton Diamond. John Money is the bad guy. He was a psychologist. He was, he was a psychologist who formulated the psychosexual neutrality at birth theory. He maintained that we learn our sexuality. And this theory, we come into the world with a sexually blank brain, okay? We learn our sexual identity, we learn our sexual orientation. And this evolved into the optimal gender of rearing policy uh, that uh, uh, required that you uh, make sure that the genitalia look conventional so that the patient and the parents don't get confused about what their gender is supposed to be. And if you have altered the genitalia, you have to lie to this person because that would spoil the, the optimal gender rearing. You know. uh, now, Milton Diamond was a biologist. In fact, he was a graduate student in that University of Kansas lab that published that first paper in 1959. So he has an evolutionary view, uh, paid a lot of attention to the animal work. He wrote a great paper challenging Money's theory way back in 65 when Milton Diamond was just a grad student, but nobody paid attention to it because he was just a grad student. And John Money was already a big shot at Johns Hopkins. David Reimer was John Money's most famous patient, and uh, this case was known as the John Joan case in the medical literature. David Reimer was an identical twin boy whose penis was uh, destroyed in a circumcision accident. The distraught parents consulted John Money, who said, well, we'll make him a girl. So they castrated this little baby. They surgically uh, altered him to look female, raised this kid as a girl, lied to him, told him he was born a girl, and uh, John Money announced to the world that this was a great success, that this kid was growing up as a well-adjusted, happy girl and becoming a well-adjusted, happy woman. And uh, you can see... Uh, here is uh, David as a little girl, Brenda. And at the age, this kid was miserable though. John Money was telling the world that the kid was a happy girl, but he wasn't. He was miserable, 
made a lousy girl, and at the age of 14, without knowing he'd been lied to, without knowing he was born a boy, he decided to live in the world as a male. At this point, the father broke down and told him the truth, and for the first time, David Reimer understood who he was. And here you see him debuting as a male. He had surgery, he took hormones. He really tried hard to reclaim his life and live it according to his uh, sensibility. He even married a woman with children. Oh, uh, I have to go back and say, uh, so what happened? John Money kept telling everybody that this was a big success, and when uh, David Reimer started living in the world as a man, John Money claimed to lose track of him. How convenient. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, but fortunately, Milton Diamond found David Reimer, found him in the mid-90s living as a man. And David Reimer had no idea that his case was a famous medical case. He had no idea that this case had become the model for standard care for babies with ambiguous genitalia or baby boys born with a micropenis or baby boys who had their penis destroyed. He had no idea that thousands and thousands, we have no idea really how many, thousands of intersex babies all over the world had their genitalia mutilated or lied to and raised in a gender that didn't feel right for who they are. When David Reimer understood that all these intersex people were suffering, he decided to cooperate with Milton Diamond and he uh, came forward and told his story. And this was the beginning of the end for John Money and his bogus theory. However, John Money's theory took hold in the 50s and, pre and prevailed through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and through most of the 90s, and his legacy lives on, as I will uh, show you. Uh, this phalometer was uh, designed by an intersex group to show how John Money's theory played out in medical <coughs> practice. So, if you were a baby boy, your penis could never be too big, but it certainly could be <coughs> too small. And if it was smaller than an inch, well, we're just gonna hack it off and raise you as a girl, okay? And a clitoris can never be too small, but it certainly can be too big, and if it's too big, we're hacking it off with its nerve endings, and uh, that'll make you an Eve, you see? You gotta be an Adam or an Eve. You gotta be able to penetrate or be penetrated. You never can be something in between or both or neither. Now, ever since uh, John Money was exposed as a quack, many of the intersex people have been coming forward out of the shadows, out of the secrecy and shame. And now we can learn about their sexuality. So what about these people with complete androgen and sensitivity uh, syndrome? What is their sexual identity? Guess what? All of them feel female because the testosterone could not work in their brain. Okay? And how about the people with partial androgen and sensitivity? Well, some feel like males and some feel like females. It varies. So many raised as boys live as uh, females as they get older. Many raised as girls live as, as men as they get older. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, most of these uh, uh, females are heterosexual women, but the incidence of bisexuality and lesbianism is higher, and that goes along with the organization activation mechanism. And then there's a group of intersex people. This is called cloacal extrophy. This condition uh, causes malformation of the entire pelvic region, and usually the genitalia are poorly formed, if at all. Uh, half of these babies are genetic males, XY, and the testes have produced testosterone normally before birth, but because of John Money's policy, these people uh, were sub, uh, subjected to feminizing genital plasty. Of course, they were castrated and uh, lied to and raised as girls and told they were born girls. And guess what we know now? Many, many of these people, as they grow up, uh, start living in the world as men without knowing that they've been lied to. So clearly, something very powerful and something very innate is going on here. It has nothing to do with their upbringing. And finally, the brain work, where we compare the brains of trans and gay people with the brains of Adams and Eves. Okay, and if you got your hands on a bunch of transsexual brains, where would you look to compare them? Why, the animal work says, look at the anterior hypothalamus. So that's where they looked, and guess what they found? They found this nucleus, it's a pair actually, called the bed nuclei of the stria terminalis. Now this is the region where the emotional brain, the amygdala, is sending in emotional information to the anterior hypothalamus, the sexual brain. And uh, we know if you destroy this area, there is no sexual behavior. 
And this is a typical straight man. This is a typical straight woman. This is a gay guy to show that this region has nothing to do with sexual orientation. Gay men and straight men look the same here. But this, this is a male to female transsexual. And I want you to notice how similar this region looks to that of a typical female. These scientists incorporate a control to show that the size of this uh, nucleus is not influenced by sex hormones in adulthood. The inference being that these brain regions were organized before birth. Now that was a study looking at the presynaptic nerve endings coming into the nucleus. A second study looked at the postsynaptic uh, cells and found the same kinds of results. Straight man, straight woman, gay man, male to female, transsexual. In this study, we also have the first and only uh, female to male brain. And when we look at this nucleus and that individual, there it is with all the other typical men. And here's somebody who was male-bodied but felt female ever since uh, you could remember, but never did anything about it. No surgery, no, homo no hormones. And now when we look at this part of the brain in that person, it looks the same as in regular females and in the trans women. Now I think this uh, tells us that trans uh, people are not crazy. And they're not imagining or, or making anything up that what they say about how they feel about themselves is real. Okay? And plus, we have genetic evidence. Uh, there's a high proportion of a male to females who carry a gene that uh, codes for a longer version of the androgen receptor, which is known to weaken the testosterone effect. And this could explain uh, why the brain did not uh, uh, get altered to give them a male identity. And there's also a high proportion of female to male people who carry uh, <coughs> genes that code for enzymes that cause a lot of sex uh, steroids to be made before birth, and this could masculinize the brain and cause them to have a male identity. How about sexual orientation? Well, now we know gay people are all over the world and that homosexuality is widespread in the animal kingdom. And again, uh, you get a hold of a bunch of uh, gay brains like Simon LeVay did back in 91, and he looked at the anterior hypothalamus, of course, and we find that only this one pair of nuclei there, the third interstitial nuclei of the anterior hypothalamus, are uh, very different between gay, gay men and straight men. Straight men have a much bigger nucleus, and gay men have a size nucleus similar to that of regular females. And a second study done on human brains confirmed the first study. And moreover, uh, when scientists looked at rams who were known to be exclusively gay and compared them to the straight rams and looked at this, these nuclei in the anterior hypothalamus, what do you think they found? They found the same thing that we found in the human studies. And functionally, we know the anterior hypothalamus lights up for same-sex pheromones in gay people and opposite-sex pheromones in straight people. And we know uh, that there is a genetic component in both gayness and lesbianism. Uh, and so this wordy slide is filled with quotations from the scientific experts in the field. I didn't want to change what they had to say. Gender identity and sexual orientation are programmed or organized into our brain structures when we are still in the womb. Since sexual differentiation, this next uh, uh, statement addresses the origins of transsexuality. Since sexual differentiation of the genitals takes place in the first two months of pregnancy and sexual differentiation of the brain starts in the second half of pregnancy, these two processes can be influenced independently, which may result in extreme cases in transsexuality. So notice it's not that they mislearned their gender roles or something went wrong when they were being raised as little kids. This is an innate uh, phenomenon. And now the next statement is the scientist talking to the pediatricians and telling them to stop the infant uh, genital mutilation. This also means that in the event of ambiguous sex at birth, the degree of masculinization of the genitals may not reflect the degree of masculinization of the brain. So don't think you can guess what the sexual identity of this kid is gonna be by looking at the genitalia. You're gonna have to let this child grow up and they will tell you who they are. And finally, a humdinger sentence. There is no indication that social environment after birth has an effect on gender identity or sexual orientation. So, you know what? We don't learn our sexual identity, and we don't learn our sexual orientation. We discover it. 
So what has the medical community been doing to LGBTI people? Well, they've pathologized and stigmatized us from the get-go. And their policy has been to fix LGBTI people, make them conform to the gender binary. And I'm sure you know, gay people have had all sorts of atrocities visited upon them. They've been castrated. They've been administered sex hormones. They've been psychoanalyzed. They've been negatively conditioned to homoerotic stimuli. They've had their hypothalamus lesioned. They've been submitted to electroshock treatment and epileptic insult, and none of these things have worked. That's a very uh, impressive uh, kind of evidence right there. And homosexuality has been classified as crazy since the inception of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, of Mental Illnesses, which is the Bible of the American Psychiatric Association. And gay people, we got ourselves removed from the DSM through political activism, there never was any science in this story. The psychiatrists never had a shred of evidence to show that gay people are crazy. And yet, the reparative therapy continues in spite of the fact that we know that it doesn't work and that it causes harm. And this quote here, saying that they're even using shock treatment still, is from an article in a newspaper from this month. The anti-trans quackery continues too. In the DSM, uh, trans people are crazy. They have gender identity disorder. And the World Health Organization, as well as the American Psychiatric Association, considers trans people crazy. And not only that, but they have given the revision of the DSM over to rep reparative therapy quacks. Uh, and uh, uh, they are changing the name to uh, placate uh, uh, trans activists. But Trans people are still crazy in the DSM. What about intersex people? What is the medical community doing to them? Guess what? They're still mutilating the genitalia of intersex babies. Whatever happened to medical ethics? Whatever happened to informed consent? Whatever happened to first do no harm? And speaking of harm, now that uh, money has been exposed, there have been a few follow-up studies uh, these are males, half-breeds, female, half-breeds, male, and down at the lower table is uh, all genetic males raised as girls, and that's a few thousand, 12 people from Germany, and just look at those numbers, they're horrible. In spite of all the surgeries, these people hate their bodies, they're having all kinds of problems, two-thirds with sexual dysfunction. This word here means uh, painful sex. Uh, you know, doctors with scores like these, you never would have gotten into medical school. And these very researchers never asked what if we had done nothing? What if we left the genitalia alone with the nerve endings intact and everything working? And uh, Milton Diamond went to the uh, American Pediatric uh, Conference in 2000. He said, listen, you've got to declare a moratorium on these general normalization surgeries until you can prove that you're doing something good. And they said, no, no, we're not declaring a moratorium. And they used parental distress and prejudice to justify the ongoing damaging surgery. And not only that, the pediatricians actually voted to not inform their former patients of their intersex status and previous medical treatments. And in response to intersex activism, they devised new pathologizing terminology so that all intersex people are disordered. And to boot, those quacks that are revising the DSM have invented a new form of craziness for intersex people who are unhappy with the gender assigned to them at birth. It's very clear that we need to reform medical care for LGBTI people. The scientific message that core sexuality is innate needs to reach everybody. LGBTI people are natural variations. Yeah, we're different, but we're not disordered. And the medical people should have as their goal our health and happiness, not trying to convert us into Adams or Eves. Clearly, ethical guidelines for medical treatment of LGBTI people should be established because medical policy should be based on scientific evidence and ethical principles, not religious myth. Thank you. Intersexuality is not a condition or a defect. There's nothing wrong with these people. They are born as they are supposed to be born. To label intersex people as having disorders of sex development has reinforced the thought process that unless all human beings can be classified as either male or female, Without variation, unless all humans can reproduce, they are classified as defective. 
the perception of an intersex infant as having something wrong with them is based on a school of theology and ideology. Since most modern cultures were designed and based off of ancient regional and non-regional religious systems, some are biased and not respectful of the natural occurrence and vast array of intersex people. Whether or not they were socially tolerated or accepted by any particular culture, the existence of intersex people was known to many ancient and pre-modern cultures. In some cultures, such people were included in larger third gender or gender blending social roles along with other individuals. In most societies, intersex people have been expected to conform to either female or a male gender role. In the last decade or so, contemporary social activists, scientists, and health practitioners, among others, have begun to revisit the issue. Acknowledgement and acceptance of the existence of physical sexual variation in human beings has increased. Dr. Louis Gorin is an endocrinologist living in Amsterdam. To date, he's treated almost 2,400 transsexuals, making him one of the world's leading experts on the topic. Transsexualism strikes where it pleases, and you find uh, people of all walks of life in your transsexual population. You find transsexuals all over the world. Research on the transsexual brain has been nearly impossible to obtain. The grim fact is many details of the brain can only be revealed during dissection. But Dr. Gorin and his colleagues at the Netherlands Brain Institute have taken the groundbreaking first steps in such research, the first and only study in which donated brains of deceased transsexuals have been dissected. Dr. Dick Schwab was in charge of the study. I think it took me uh, some 12 years or so to collect uh, eight brains. It takes a long time. Doctors knew the area of the brain they thought might yield answers. The hypothalamus, a small hormone-producing section buried deep at the base of the brain, an area that scientists already knew demonstrated physical differences between biological males and females. The hypothalamuses were dissected and prepared for study. Lead researcher Dr. Frank Kyber explains. So what we are looking at here is the microtome, which is a way to cut brain material into very thin slices. Once prepared on slides, the slices of hypothalamus are exposed to chemicals that reveal neuron fibers. It was already known that the normal biological male and female brains had very different neuron patterns in this part of the brain. So you can see here the difference between a born male and a born female in a structure that is important for sexual behavior. And you can see in the first place that in the male, the structure is bigger than in the female. In the second place, it's also clear that it's containing much more of those black points, which are fibers coming in from another brain area that is important for uh, sexual behavior. The question was, how would the transsexual brains compare to normal male and female brains? The answer offered the only biological evidence ever collected that confirms what transsexuals have always believed. Their brains are not like others. This one is a born male, but uh, from the age of five or eight years onwards, he felt that in fact he was female. So it's a male to female transsexual. You can see that the size and also the type of innovation of this structure is typically female, not male. Simply put, every single transsexual brain studied more closely resembled the opposite sex from which it was born. Many basic questions must still be answered, such as what effects do female hormones have on the brain? Interestingly, one of the male-born transsexual brains studied had never been subjected to female hormones and still showed the same feminine characteristics, possibly indicating that hormone treatment is not the cause of the brain differences. The sampling of eight brains is small, but the consistency of the findings is still encouraging to scientists. Believers and skeptics alike would prefer more information about the cause. Final realm of neurobiology, rather than issues of gay versus straight, what is the neurobiology of transsexuality? 
And that used to be considered to be purely a domain of psychopathology. If being gay used to be a certifiable psychiatric disorder up until the early 1970s, the American Psychiatric Association in their textbook, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, you could be psychiatrically certified as ill. A psychiatric disorder was being homosexual or lesbian. And then in what had to have been one of the more all-time blowout committee meetings ever, they decided that, no, actually it's not a psychiatric disorder, and overnight about 40 million Americans were cured of a psychiatric disease. <laughs> the notion of transsexuality as a psychiatric disorder has had much, much longer shelf life. What's the neurobiology of that? To date, there have been a handful of studies, and they show essentially the same thing. Really, really interesting. Another region of the brain that shows a sex difference in its average size. Don't even worry about the name of this. It's called the bed nucleus of the striae terminalis. It's where the amygdala begins to send its projection into the hypothalamus. Another one to those gender differences. There's one type of neuron in there with a certain type of neurotransmitter where very, very reliably it is about twice the size in males than in females. Sufficiently so that even in human brains, you could pretty confidently determine the sex of somebody by seeing the number of these neurons. You'll see I'm not even saying the name of the neurotransmitter. It's irrelevant. It's just another one of those differences, a dimorphism in a region of the brain, a really, really reliable one. And this was a study done by some superb neuroanatomists looking at transsexuals. And what they showed was very interesting which was very, very reliably and a very powerful effect what you would see in their large, large sample size of transsexuals' brains post-mortem was people would have this part of the brain the size not of their sex that they were born with, but rather of the sex they insisted they always actually were. Wow. Immediate questions one must ask. Okay, well, maybe this is due to the fact that when people change gender, transsexual procedures, there's a whole lot of hormones involved, and maybe that's doing something to this part of the brain. Critical control that they had was this was looking both at transsexuals who had made gender changes and those who went to their deathbed saying, this is not the sex that I am. I got the wrong body, but never made the change. It wasn't a function of having actually gone through the transition and the endocrine manipulations with it. Another control they had, which was looking at men who would get a certain type of testicular cancer where they would have to be treated with certain feminizing hormones, in other words, very similar to some of the endocrine treatments of male to female transgendered individuals, and post-mortem, you didn't see the changes there. It has nothing to do with the hormones. It had to do with the person insisting from day one that they got the wrong body. And this was a landmark study, fabulously well done and controlled and replicated once since then, showing that what transsexualism used to be thought of is that people who think that they're a different gender than they actually are. What this study suggests is what transsexualism is about is people who got the wrong gendered body. And these are people who are chromosomally of one sex. In terms of their gonads, they're of that sex. In terms of their hormones, they're of that sex. In terms of their genitalia and their secondary sexual characteristics, they're of that sex. But they're insisting that's not who I really am. This part of the brain agrees with them. Also, very interestingly, that study was done by the same Dutch scientists who did this one. Again, this is very complex terrain in terms of what these things wind up implicating. Interestingly, that study was published right around the time that the city of San Francisco did something very cool, which was for city employees now, medical insurance will cover transgender operations. However, there's no evidence that the obscure endocrine journal published out of Latvia or something did that like the afternoon before. You know, the San Francisco commissioners had their meeting on that one. But nonetheless, this is a subject with all sorts of realms of implications. One additional study about transsexualism. Okay, how many of you know about phantom limb syndrome? Okay.
You are a guy with a penis, and you get a certain type of penile cancer, and what's often done is your penis is excised, it is cut off, and about 60% of men who have had to have their penises removed because of cancer there wind up getting phantom, pe phantom penile sensations, which I don't want to know about. <laughs> What you see, though, is when you take transgendered individuals who go from male to female, in other words, as part of it, having their penises removed, 0% rate of penile phantom sensation. Suggestion being that there is something much more normal in that case than when a penis is being removed for cancer. A whole new area of research, very novel, very challenging. Okay. One very important issue concerning this matter is the necessity for improved science and total separation from any religious theologies, ideologies, and or biases. It is not how we mistreat somebody that makes us important, it's how well we treat them.